Um, the title is basically trying to understand um, and talk about geotechnical databases and assessments. Got a long story short, we'll, we'll just move straight into it. Um, these are the authors, there's obviously myself and there's two co-authors um, who aren't here today, unfortunately, but uh, they are located in um, in Arizona, United States, where a particular case history I'm going to talk about is. Uh, in terms of rock messes, um, fundamentally all of our jobs is to understand what their what their character is, and I guess the first place you start. We talked about the block model uh, just in the previous discussion with Simon. Um, I think. Everybody would, everybody would agree that would agree that you um, the only way to understand um, an, an ore body or a deposit is through um, having enough drill holes, and that's a fundamental part of um, legal obligations and um, about uh, announcing to the market about block models, etc. Um, geostatistics is the most obvious one area of expertise for that, that sort of understanding of deposits. Um, you need drill hole database, um, assays, et cetera, et cetera. And I think particularly coming from a, originally from a geological background, it, it, seem, it seems to make sense, I suppose, you'd think, oh, well, for a geotechnical or a rock mechanics assessment, surely that's the same thing. You know, the more data, the better. Um, and that's fine, uh, but, and I don't disagree to some extent. But of course, putting geotechnical databases together, it's it's not inconsiderable inconsider amount of time and money being spent on it. Obviously, databases have got to be formed with drill hole data and, and lab testing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it takes a lot of time to do that and a lot of money and people, um, all of which we don't seem to have enough of um, if we ever have. But I guess the question often comes up, and I think all of the people on the on the the call today would have come up against the situation, what if you don't have enough? Um, first of all, what's enough? Well, that's a really good question. And I, uh, you know, I have an opinion and like everybody, everybody has belly buttons as everyone says an opinion about these sorts of things. But the troubling thing that I've come across in the industry is this approach where if it's not enough geotechnical data or the database is um, non-existent or more likely just limited we should use a simple geotechnical assessment tool um it's very it's been advocated and it's unfortunately it's 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 wrong-headed um, and overlooks a few critical things um it confuses fundamentally statistical analysis which is probably closer than we talk about geostatistics and a, a drill hole database for a resource um and an engineering analysis um, and they shouldn't be confused um, a well-developed geotechnical database can't make up for using a, a simplified tool, um, but is the reverse true? And I would suggest, yes, it, it actually is. Um, and this is an example here. I, th I like this, this image because I think it sort of hits the nail on the head. Um, on the right-hand side, you're talking about um, formula. And if I said to you, well, put it another way, well, uh, some people advocate that if you've got to uh, simple geotechnical database. Um, we'll just we'll just use some simple tools, and of course those simple tools often ignore critical aspects of engineering and, and Newtonian mechanics. Um, and on the right hand side, I'd imagine if I said to you, well, I don't really have much um, information about um, g or or gravity or acceleration. So I'm, instead of using force equals mass times gra gravity or mass times acceleration, I'm just going to ignore that, and I'm just going to have force equals mass or if I've removed any of the, the um, components of the, the other uh, formula above. I mean, if I said that to you, I think you'd probably agree pretty quickly. Well, it's pretty crazy. Why can't you make some assumptions um, about that? But you certainly can't just ignore um, aspects of it. Um, and I just want to run into this. We're talking about a case study, um, and, but there's a bit of a lead into this and I'll keep this quick because it's been covered in a few other talks already. Um, in terms of uh, slope stability assessments, broadly speaking, they um, fall into empirical methods, um, formal or otherwise. 
although I think we've moved away from that largely um, now. And often there's uh, people using numerical assessments or limit equilibrium methods as well, because they overcome a lot of the, the problems with empirical approaches. Um, this particular case study, which I'm going to get into in a minute, um, is quite complex uh, geology. And consequently, there was a deci decision to make um, to use numerical modeling. And uh, I guess this comes back to this point about um, the geotechnical database. If you have an appropriate tool, um, it becomes less sensitive to the data inputs, which is not the case for more simple approaches and why people have, uh, tend to want to use them and therefore say you have to have a lot of data. Um, I'm going to keep this pretty quick because um, we don't have time and a lot of people's eyes can glaze over. But an important part of using a numerical model is a lot of people think that one numerical model is, is the same as another, and that's not right. Um, broadly speaking, um, numerical codes tend to fit in these three categories. Um, elastic modelling, inelastic time independent implicit modelling, um, and that's quite, quite commonly used, or both of those are. Um, you're obviously, the, they become quite sensitive to the inputs and you're often not getting explicit values, um, you're getting in, in, implicit values. Um, and you have to, particularly with the, the second one there, you have to um, also come up with post peak behavior properties as well. Um, there's inelastic time dependent uh, approaches and you know they're more advanced codes. Um, you can see on the right hand side some examples as well. Um, and they often, they will generate, they can generate um, more realistic answers, which you compare, you can compare to actual real world um, uh, monitoring answers. Um, the other important part is that not only are numerical models different, but you also have to use the right constitutive model. And again, I'm not going to labor the point here because um, it's already been uh, brought up. There's the linear elastic um, uh, constitutive model, if, if you can call it any constitutive model, technically. Uh, strain softening more column, very, very common to use. Um, but again, you need to develop the post-peak post properties, which brings in that element of, well, how do you do that? Then you move into proprietary, um, more advanced constitutive models. Um, and some of these ones can actually take, in, take into consideration, they, they, they look after the post-peak values themselves as they change with the confinement and things like that. For this particular model, um, <coughs> excuse me, assessment I did for the case study, I used the IUCM. Again, I'm not going to go back into this. It's already been covered considerably already by the other speakers. Um, I guess the main thing is that it, it will change. It's, it can cycle because you're using um, the right tool, which in this case is Black 3D. So you're getting that time dependent behavior. You uh, the post-peak behavior is being looked after by the constitutive model itself, so you don't have to try and sit around and come up with some post-peak values to put in. So it allows for changes in confinement as the mo as the model uh, progresses and mining progresses, and also for dilation as well, which are two two critical aspects of the constitutive model. So the case study um, basically had very little data; it had no drilling. Uh, data and had uh, all, all lab testing data. Some previous work had been tried tried to do it with some two D limit equilibrium assessments, and it, it just didn't really work. And I'm not, to be honest, I'm not surprised. Just the the complexity of the rock was such that I would have been very difficult to get it to work. And there's also two D two dimensional um, problems as well, which are shared by both limit equilibrium and numerical modeling two D um, software. Um, but luckily there was a database of uh, prism and radar information which was which was great um and the, the problem was that they had some instability in the pit um had tried to understand it with limited success and they really wanted to know well can we uh can we keep mining this or not because if it's an uh, economic decision if we can't do it we're going to you know waste a whole lot more money and that's where this assessment was undertaken the rock mass itself was pretty, um, generally pretty weak, but it was historically the many faults throughout the deposit had controlled the um, the behaviour of the slope. Um, it uh, so what we did was did a two phases, a calibration phase where we took 
um, monitoring data and just the overall behavior of the pit um, to date. And uh, you can see some of the other information that was there, some photographs and so forth, and just discussions with people on site. Um, calibrated the model. Um, and we did that, as I said, using the, the um, displacement information, the monitoring information. And then the, obviously the last step is to run it forward, forwards. <coughs> um, I'll move into the, the, the results straight away because we're running pretty close to time. Um, once the model was calibrated, um, we ran the whole mine, life of mine model boards. And what you could see is it was getting a lot of surface failure, which they had already had experience with um, um, managing. So they were okay to do that. They didn't feel a need to um, uh, stop mining. However, they were shallow failures. That was what was projected rather than deep seated, um, complete wall failures. And that was, um, uh, so they, were, they made the decision to move ahead with it with a whole lot of mitigation uh, processes in place. Um, they they finished the mine, and I suppose the the, the um, how you can see here is what it looked like at the end of the mining. See, it was quite weak. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't get something more in front of it rather than the side. But you can see that they lost a lot of the the benches, um, which was expected from the, the modelling results, as you can see up there. And um, but they were still able to 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 complete the mine, and obviously it was economic. And this last image here is um, the modeling results on uh, painted onto the, the final mine design. And those spheres are actual, the results also from the life of mine of the uh, monitoring uh, uh, array. And you can see how closely they match. Now, it's not perfect in everywhere, but you can see how closely they match. And I think the, the important thing to remember here is that the amount of data that was available to do this was very, very limited. However, with the right tools, you can actually uh, do high-end assessments and really understand how the, the complicated mechanics of, of rock masses and how they, they work and what they like, the rock mass response to mining. Um, but again, you've got to use the right tools to do these things, the right constitutive model and the right numerical code as well, um, just to be absolutely clear about that as well. Um, there's a few conclusions here, but I don't think I, I think I've sort of already outlined them in the interest of time. Um, I don't think I need to um, go through them one by one. But I also want to make this clear as well that I'm not saying that we don't need to go and get geotechnical databases anymore. That's not at all what I'm saying. If you've got a, a well developed one, that's fantastic. But that shouldn't, if you don't, it shouldn't stop you from running um, more advanced, use, using more advanced tools to try and understand the complicated nature of the rock and its uh, response to mining. Um, yeah, I think that, that will do.